But my hypothesis, my speculation, is that the brain is full of this, this kind of filling in mechanisms that help us in imagining uh, things and, and getting perceptions. Uh, so th th this is the basis I, I, I want to start my, my uh, speculation about. And our understanding of the minds of others is one example of this. So let's get back to what we need is. Now, one thing is that our brain is very fond of finding causes, here and there and everywhere. I mean, if we don't find the cause of an, of an event, we are, we are very quick at inventing a, a cause. And this book that Hugo mentioned, the Manning Circle and the Manning there, there I discuss the consequences of this, that we have this causal, causal drive, as I, as I call it. But we, we are very good at perceiving forces, for instance, in, in, in the world. We're very good uh, naive Newtonians or naive uh, Aristotelians. It turns out um, uh, that, well, I, I believe that these forces are part of the variables that the, the simulators in our brain are, are using. That is, for me, causation is a mental phenomenon. That's something that's created by our brain. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not taking a philosophical stand on what's causation in the real world, but in our cognition, we, we are very happy to fill in causes everywhere. I mean, no matter what, what process it is. Um, then we also fill in when it comes to, to um, the mental forces. I mean, this is an analogy. I don't really believe in mental forces. But anyway, we, we think about the uh, emotions and desires and, and beliefs of other people. And we use that. We are very quick at, at, at at assuming that there are other people have inner worlds and that these worlds con are, are built up from beliefs and desires and, 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 and so on. And that's part of our simulations in our interactions with, with, uh, with other people. And this is what I will focus on in the rest of the talk. But before I get there, let me say two more words about these perceiving forces. It turns out that we humans are, are much better than other primates on this. And uh, it's fairly recently that it's been discovered. I mean, this was a book published uh, in 2000 that really uh, uh, broke new grounds here. Uh, Povinelli had done a, a series of experiments with chimps uh, mainly, and some other people have repeated it. Uh, it turns out that they are very bad at reasoning about gravitational forces. So, typical experiment. This is a glass tube. That's a peanut. That's a, uh, a, some kind of... Uh, 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 extension of the glass tube. So if the chimp puts the stick this way, the peanut will fall out to this end. If the chimp put the stick, puts the stick this way, the peanut will fall down here and it can't reach it. So the chimp is given the stick and the researchers study in what, what way the chimps put the stick. I mean, uh, the, the, position of the uh, position of the peanut is randomized, the position of, of this bulb is also uh, randomized. Uh, there are all kinds of controls. So guess what happens? Well, they do it 50, 60 times, the chips. And after 50, 60 times, it's still random whether they put it from the left or the right side. I mean, whether they put it from... They can't pick up the idea of the, of the peanut falling into this glass bulb, bulb, bulb and, 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 and not, not, they can't get it out. They don't learn here. While if you give a human child the same task, as soon as the human child at all can put a stick through the glass tube, it will solve the problem. There is a very surprising difference in our way of reasoning. And there are other, other experiments. I don't have to, time to get into it. But apparently, humans are much better at reasoning about f physical forces than, than the, the primates are. Now, let's get to... Oh, I have to say something more about... Chimps can plan. I mean, this is Kohler, Wolfgang Kohler, who in the, during the First World War studies chimps on, on Tenerife, and these are photos from there. He placed a banana up under the roof. And they were in a big cage with lots of boxes, and sometimes they succeeded in solving the problem, like on this picture. I actually have a cut from a BBC movie. This is, I think th this white guy is Curler himself, I'm not sure. But this is a movie from the 1910s. The quality is not very good. But he's hanging a banana up in the, up in the roof. And let's see what happens. Huh? So look at the chip, how, how, how they're playing, placing the boxes. Uh, they're, they're not very good at, 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 at I mean, look at their understanding of the physics of boxes. Uh, that's more interesting. Uh, well, yeah. They're not very, I mean, they're much worse than a two-year-old child would be in doing this. Uh, 
And finally, uh, he, he gets the banana by hanging into it. Uh, uh, And, and then, then comes the continuation. There is a banana up here, but you don't see it. And now the, the chimp only has a big stick, and no, no boxes anymore. He got a banana. I said, but this is good gymnastics, but not, uh, maybe not very good planning. Yeah. Anyway, you, you can see from this stack of, the, of boxes that the, the chimps don't really have any idea of the statics of the, of the boxes. So, and, uh, and it's only very seldom that they could, that they could solve, uh, solve these problems because the boxes were falling down all the time. And so that's another indication of, of that they're not very good at physics. But this is, of course, a case, an already Curler interpreted as a case of planning. That is, they form a kind of mental image of... of how the boxes would look like, and they could stand on the boxes, and then I could reach the banana. And we find planning in, 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 in the mammals and in, 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 in the birds. They, I mean, they, they have the mental capacities of forming, forming these inner images of something uh, happening before they're actually, actually uh, doing it. But all cases we see of um, uh, planning in, in other animals are for things that are here and now. There is food available, there is a danger and, 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 or a mate or something. They, they're planning for immediate goals. While in humans we can find what I, previously I call it anticipatory planning, but now we call it prospective planning. That you can imagine that you will be hungry tomorrow, you will be cold in the winter and so on. So you're planning for future goals. And this was thought, even Kohler speculated, that this was thought to be uh, uniquely human. Now there is some recent evidence from um, Joseph Kohl and Thomas Sellers group in Leipzig, the Max Planck Institute. They have, they have made uh, gorillas, uh, no, an orang no, gorilla and a chimpanzee save a tool for, for use for tomorrow. And I have a PhD student who's doing with chimps and orangutans in, in uh, Furevik up in a uh, zoo in Sweden. And he has some more, some slightly stronger results. Uh, but the idea is that the, 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 the chimps can save a tool for future use. And my PhD student, Matthias, he has even shown that they can uh, uh, abstain from a small goal now in order to achieve a bigger goal in the future, big, bigger reward in the, in the future. So there are some signs of elementary prospective planning in, in the great apes not as developed as in the humans. And these are, in particular, when you have to abstain from a small reward now in order to get a, a, a gratification later, what's called delayed gratification. That is dependent on, on control from the, from the, uh, from the uh, frontal lobes, and you have to block, block the desire to, to get the, the current uh, goal. So this gives us a uniquely human dilemma. We have to choose between getting what we want now. I mean, I'm, I want to, may, may want to smoke now or have, eat this box of candy or do whatever. Um, but I realize that in the long run this may not be good for me. So I have this conflict between satisfying my desires for the present or planning for the, uh, for the future. And we solve this differently as individuals, but we are all f f more or less faced with, uh, faced with uh, this dilemma. While the other animals are not in this dilemma, uh, with some minor exceptions. Now, let me get to the real topic of my talk, and that is this theory of mind or intersubjectivity. And in this book, How Homo Became Sapiens, I did made a distinction uh, between uh, four different levels of intersubjectivity. One is to understand or imagine the emotions of others. This is what's called empathy. One is to understand the attention of others. One is to understand the goals or, uh, yeah, uh, of, of others, and the final is the beliefs or the knowledge uh, of others. Uh, I made this distinction because it helps me to understand the development of children, it helps me to understand what's going on in, in other species. And then you can relate this to self-consciousness, that is the capacity to Im imagining or thinking or reflecting upon the, the mind of yourself. And it, it turns out that these two capacities are, are, are quite closely connected. 
So, I want to develop a little bit on each of these uh, uh, components of intersubjectivity or, or a uh, theory of mind. So, let's start with, yeah, of course.